government. Now, legislator Bob Wawino will any minute now know whether he will be released on bail or not. The Ambakasi East Member of Parliament spent his second day in police cells yesterday and his supporters have jammed Midimani courts where the case is currently being heard. Several lawyers are representing Wino, including Senator James Orengo and Otieno, Otiende Molo, among others. And uh, we are now bringing you the live pictures there from the Milimani Law Courts. The judge has just uh, checked in, so to speak, to give that uh, determination. Let's just cross over there live and listen in, even as they settle in court awaiting that ruling. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've come this way. Yes. It may please your honor, I have the privilege of introducing the appearances. For and on behalf of the prosecution, my line of friends, Mr. Mutuku, Nicholas Mutuku, Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions. My friend Alois Kemo, Senior Assistant Director of Public Prosecution. And uh, my other friend is the Director of the Dean. The Principal, which crosses task. Uh, my advice. For the defense, my name is James Orengo. We appear together with my line of friends, uh, Tinda Moro, Nelson Harvey, and uh, Mill William.
Well, that is uh, the bail hearing for Mbakasi East uh, Member of Parliament, uh, Babu Owino, currently ongoing there. The judge is supposed to make a ruling on whether he should be released on bail or not. The prosecution had uh, requested or given prayers that he is not released on bail, uh, given how hard it was even in the first place to locate him uh, for the arrest, saying they had to use high tech, um, high technology to track him down before they arrested him. So that is the current uh, hearing that is currently ongoing at the Milimani Law Courts, um, where the magistrate there is supposed to give a ruling on the same. Let's just listen in. But I can say quite frankly that interestingly none of the propagators of these hateful messages is prepared to take the plunge because they very well appreciate that if the country sinks, the abyss is bottomless and therefore chances of getting out even for the supposed smart swimmers are slim if not nil. By nil, I mean they'll be decimated just like any other good people who abhor <clears throat> and condemn those invectives. Unfortunately, some of the propagators of these insidious, invidious messages are none other than national leaders who should be the embodiment of peace, decorum, and national unity as commanded by the supreme law of this country, the Constitution of Kenya 2010. Kenyans have dedicated the whole chapter, chapter 6, and in addition, one article, Article 10 in the Constitution, to what word may term as the discipline of state officers. I believe this discipline chapter and Article 10 this discipline chapter and article are meant to provide the guideposts for leaders who then should inevitably be emulated by the entire citizenry. By extension, therefore, Chapter 6 and Article 10 of our Constitution should guide the people of Kenya in their conduct and relations with and towards one another. What more is required of a country's people to be disciplined other than to follow the precepts and prescriptions of its National Supreme Charter? It would be understandable if this vengeance was being perpetrated by kindergarten kids, in which case it would be easy to dismiss it as, in quotes, mchongo ano. In that case, we will dismiss such talk as jokes with the belief, hope, and understanding that with the passage of time, the children will outgrow such games and facing the reality of life, discard them in the garbage dumps where they should rot and forever never come back to their minds. Unfortunately, these are messages put across by our leaders and consumed in whole and then replicated without time for interrogation by members of the public whom they lead. The members of the public pick the messages and in their little ways that suit their particular circumstances, twist them in what should please their particular fora and purposes and use it against each other. That is absurd and requires condemnation. I'm happy for one thing, though, and I'm optimistic that the future holds better prospects than today. There is this little eight-year-old boy who has completely refused to share with his parents or any other person persuading him to what tribe he or his parents are from. Try as they do to persuade him to say from which ethnic community he comes, he never mentions. He only says, I'm a Kenyan. He has maintained this position since kindergarten, and this is quite intriguing because we are brought up to value and cherish our ethnocultural backgrounds. None else other than our own constitution recognizes the importance of cultural heritage in Articles 11 and 41. We cannot blame this young boy for refusing to be identified with his tribe if it means shunning negative ethnicity. In fact, I must say that those around him should actively encourage him to pursue that path together with all his friends and young persons of this country since it appears that the older ones have designed a path for themselves to self-destruction. These young people, with little but expanding thinking, are growing up with a firm belief that identifying oneself through a tribal prism, if it means ethnic chauvinism and contempt for others, should be condemned because Article 10 of our Constitution on National Values and Principles of Governance commands us to do so. That is to enhance, uh, sorry, to embrace human dignity, equity, social justice, inclusiveness, equality, human rights, non-discrimination, and protection of the marginalized. 
I believe this young boy is slowly condemning ethnicity in his mind and he should be able to grow up as a true nationalist of this country rather than an ethnic jingoist. I truly thank the school teachers, especially at the uh, kindergarten level, who have imbued in this young boy this sense of respect and dignity for others. The National Cohesion and Integration Commission should open and maintain a continuous dialogue on the issues bedeviling this country from negative ethnicity. I'm sure if a vote is to be taken, there are millions of Kenyans out there who will form long queues day long to vote for the banishing of ethnic chauvinism to the annals of history never to be resurrected. In fact, history itself should refuse to accept even one chapter of people who advance such issues in its writings. Our collective conscience will be pricked whenever anybody, in as much as tries to, to raise an issue of tribalism in a way of attacking others for the sake of the ethnic community. We look forward to the day when we shall address one another with decorum, dignity, and pride in recognition of our Constitution's call upon us to regard others always with dignity. A call must be made upon our leaders then to be the first in line on these cues, hoisting the flag of human dignity and nothing less at the forefront. They will then be followed by all their supporters to, re to recreate Kenya into one cohesive community of persons who value one another for whom they are human beings, rather than from the tribes from which their forefathers came. I'm happy to note that there are people out there, such as Pastor James Okumu, Family Radio, to whom I listen every morning at 6 a.m. on my way to work, who unceasingly prays for this nation, that God may grant us the wisdom to know that it is more beneficial to live as one cohesive nation rather than in divisions. I'm sure there are many out there with such encouraging messages, and they should continue. Honorable Paul Ongili, better known as Babo Wino, is the current member of the National Assembly for Embakasi Constituency within Nairobi County. And Honorable Babu faces a principal charge of subversion control to Section 77.1, Capital F, an alternative charge of incitement to violence control to Section 96C, and a second count of offensive conduct control to a breach conducive to a breach of the peace control to Section 94.1, all under the penal code Cap 63, Laws of Kenya. He has pleaded not guilty to all the charges. I agree with learned senior counsel, Senator James Orengo, that these types of charges should never in this era of our constitutional dispensation find their way into the courts against anybody. But the reasons should not be, as submitted by senior counsel, because should not be because they are used as a way to subjugate others and stifle the right to self-expression or as submitted, uh, as submitted by Mr. Mtuku, Deputy DPP, that some prosecutors are not courageous enough to apply them. The reason should be that, in fact, there is no cause for anybody to be associated with conduct that will bring him near the, them because the Constitution demands of the people of Kenya to behave in a certain respective manner. The state, led by the Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions, Nicholas Mtuku, and assisted by Lois Kemo, Senior Assistant Deputy Public Prosecutor, Catherine Mwaniki, Assistant Deputy Public Prosecutor, Duncan Ondimu, Principal Public Prosecutor, and Agatha Bang, Public uh, Prosecution Counsel, objects to his release on bond. The reasons advanced by the state for the objection to the release of the accused person on bond are contained in an affidavit sworn on 26th of September 2017 by Sajid Nicholas Oleseda, attached to the Directorate of Criminal Investigations and one of the investigating officers in the case. Sergeant Oleseda has made his depositions in some 33 paragraphs. Learned councils, Mr. Mtuku and Ms. Mwaniki, collapsed these paragraphs into four grounds which they conversed in their submissions. The objection is opposed by the defense team of learned councils led by Honorable Senator James Orengo, Senior Counsel, and Honorable Otiende Amolo, assisted by Edwin Sifuna and Ocheng Ogingo. They have strenuously opposed the application to have the accused person detained in custody pending the hearing and determination of his case. They argue that the affidavit sworn by Sergeant Olesena does not bring out any compelling reasons that would warrant a denial of bond for the accused person. Senator Orengo, learned senior counsel, urged the court to recall that the accused person is presumed innocent until proved otherwise as guaranteed under Article 52, uh, to, uh, sorry, Article 52A of the Constitution. I'm not giving a long ruling because of two reasons. First, is due to the limited time I had to do a long ruling, even as learned councils made lengthy submissions, which were presented for more than five hours. Second, and perhaps more important, is that the issue of release of an accused person on bond 
has been crystallized into the Bail and Bond Policy Guidelines 2015 and considered by higher courts in numerous decisions, and I'll not be recreating the principles that govern the subject. As I make this brief decision, I have, the, I have at the back of my mind all the submissions made by learned councils for the state and for the defense. The right of an accused person to be released on bond pending trial is guaranteed under Article 49 1H of the Constitution, which provides that, I quote, an accused person has the right to be released on bond or bail on reasonable conditions pending a charge or trial unless there are compelling reasons not to be released. It follows from this constitutional provision that, the very, that every accused person has a right to be released on bond pending his trial. The court has the primary responsibility to ensure that the right of the accused person is enjoyed as provided. The right is only limited where there are compelling reasons to deny bond. The burden to demonstrate compelling reasons rests upon the prosecution, and as rightly pointed out by Mr. Mtuku, the learned deputy DPP, the standard of proof is on a balance of probabilities. It has been held in various authorities on decided cases that in determining whether or not the prosecution has demonstrated that there are compelling reasons to refuse an accused person bond, the primary consideration is whether the accused person will attend court and be available at the trial. All factors and facts and circumstances must be considered with this central principle in mind. Under the Bail and Bond Policy Guidelines 2015, it is provided in paragraph 3.1 uh, various principles derived from, the, from international best practices are outlined there to guide the court in decision making. These are the right of an accused person to be presumed innocent, the accused person's right to liberty, the accused person's obligation to attend trial, the right to reasonable bail and bond terms, bail determination must be must balance the rights of the accused persons and the interests of justice and consideration of the rights of victims. Some of the relevant factors and facts that guide court in determining the issues are the, the nature of the charge, the strength of the evidence which supports the charge, the gravity of the punishment in the event of a conviction, the previous criminal record of the accused, if any, the probability that the accused person may not surrender himself for trial, the likelihood of the accused interfering with witnesses or that he may suppress any evidence such as incriminate him, the likelihood of further charges being brought against the accused, the probability of a finding of guilt, detention for the protection of the accused person, the necessity to procure a medical or so social report pending the disposal of the, uh, uh, of the case, and these factors were considered by both senior, uh, senior counsel James Orengo and um, Mr. Mutuku, Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions. They are also conversed in the case of Republic versus Danson, Mugunya and Kasim Shebuana Mohammed, Mombasa High Court, criminal case number 26 of 2008 by Mohammed uh, Jay uh, as he then was. This case is quite instructive on this matter. I've, con I've carefully considered the objection raised by the prosecution to the release of the accused persons on bond through the supporting affidavit thrown by Sergei Nicolas Solesena and the submissions by learned counsels both for the prosecution in supporting the objection and the defense in urging the court to release the accused person on bond. I now consider the issues as raised in the submissions as against the parameters set above. Mr. Mtuku, learned, uh, learned uh, deputy, director of public prosecution, submits that the charges facing the accused person are very serious. The principal charge attracts a maximum penalty of seven years imprisonment, while the alternative carries five years imprisonment. This, according to the learned senior, the learned deputy public prosecutor, Mr. Mtuku, is a sufficient cause to the accused person to abscond court. Learned counsel, senior counsel, Senator James Orengo, and Honorable Tienda Mola have sought to track the offense charged in the first count as being non-existent in law. And uh, I will not dwell on that for now as I will leave it to the trial court. Suffice it to say that the bond and bail, uh, and bail policy guidelines provide that the seriousness of a charge should not be a prime factor to consider in an application such, such as this. The prosecution says that the accused person was arrested from a hiding. None and counsels for the accused person submit that the accused person has a fixed place of abode and in fact that he may have several of such places. The accused person is therefore likely to abscond, uh, that is the submission by counsel. <coughs> It may be argued that deprivation of liberty to individuals is a way by which governments respond to threats to security, and detention of an accused person pending trial, also known as pretrial detention, is one way by which the deprivation of liberty is effected and which is generally considered to be legitimate in the criminal justice system. 
such detention must of course be in line with well laid down principles enunciated in several cases, among them case of Danson Mugunya, which is cited above. There is no gain saying that deprivation of the liberty of any individual should only be resorted to as a last measure. And that is why the Constitution demands that the state should establish compelling reasons for denial for denial of, uh, of bond for an accused person. The accused person in this case is charged with two offenses and an alternative. I must point out that it is not for this court at this time to consider whether the words alleged in the charge sheet were ever uttered, either by, uh, were ever uttered, whether they were uttered by the accused person and whether they amount to the offense charged. But I do not think that anybody will deny that if those words were ever used, they amount to foul language. By foul language, here I mean offensive to the senses, very disagreeable or unpleasant. And this is the case to any ordinary person walking down the streets of Nairobi, I believe. Senator um, James Orengo, senior counsel, for the accused person submits that this country should not be taken back to the dark days when political dissent was frowned upon and people arrested and incarcerated on trumped up charges similar to the ones facing the accused person. And that submission is correct, and I agree with it fully. Thank you for those who are providing for us the light. However, it must be remembered that the threat of political violence in Kenya, especially after elections, is something the country has gone through, and nobody wishes to go back to that dark period. It is real, and it has affected this country, taking lives and causing serious damage to property. It is unfortunate that members of the public who must be held innocent until the contrary is proved, come into the police radar, are arrested, and then they have to be subjected to the trial <coughs> process. The process of trial may vindicate them, or they may be found to have committed the crimes for which they were charged. When they are vindicated, for those who have been in custody, I do not think there is any measure of compensation that can restore their lost liberty for the period of detention. The Bill of Rights under the Constitution of Kenya in recognition of this issue provides for elaborate measures to be accorded to a person facing trial under the provisions of Article 50. Article 52, it provides that an accused person has a right to a fair trial, which includes to begin the right to begin and conclude without unreasonable delay. Upholding this right ensures mitigation for an accused person who has been denied bond. I've considered the case of Republic versus Richard David Alden, 2016 EKLR, provided by Learned Senior Counsel Senator James Orengo, and I find that it gives me great guidance on how to proceed in determining the issue of objection to bond, and I am guided accordingly. Contrary to the uh, submission by Mr. Mtuku, Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions, I think this decision is a locus classicus on the issue. It is not just applicable in murder cases. There are also various other decisions of the High Court where lower courts have um, denied accused persons bond for more serious offenses such as terrorism, but the, re the decisions were revised by the High Court and bond was granted. The overriding issue that the, court co the High Court considered was that the reasons given by the prosecution were not compelling enough to warrant denial of bond. In the case of Abdikadir Aden, Elias Tulu, and others versus Republic, Meru High Court Criminal Application Number 16 of 2014, the seat justice, uh, whom a, a learned senior counsel, Senator Orengo, uh, cited in the above decision, had this to say. It's a long quotation, and I'll start. I've considered the rulings of the learned trial magistrates in, the, in which bail was denied to the applicants. I am impressed by the learned trial magistrate's considerations and the manner in which he weighed all the factors and interests affecting the case. In my reading of the rulings, the reasons given by the applicants denied bail are, one, incidents of terrorist attacks are common to the point of being alarming in the country, two, the security situation in the country and it's, it's against public interest to have the security situation in the country and it's against public interest to have the accused persons being released on bond. I cite this because they are similar to the reasons which the uh, prosecution has advanced in this case. The learned judge uh, uh, proceeds, I noted the fourth person charged along with the applicants was granted bail. That was after an attempt by the state to do the charges against that accused person was declined. The bottom line is that the applicants are charged with an offense of possessing, artic uh, possessing articles connected with a terrorism offense in that the articles they had were for the use in instigating the commission of terrorist acts. Without appearing to belittle or trivialize the offenses alleged, I note that what the applicants are alleged to have found with are audio and visual material which could be used to, invest, to, in, 
instigate terrorist attack. They are in a foreign language and an appeal by the applicant's counsel to know whether there, was, there has been an interpretation of the articles into the language of the court went unanswered. Again, I pause here to say that the prosecution had argued that for the accused person, uh, in this case, witnesses were not going, uh, had not been indicated because there was a threat to, to them and that the accused person was likely to interfere with them. The learned judge continues. In other words, the audio and visual material the applicants are alleged to have been in possession of are material to be used to influence people ideologically to commit terrorist attacks. The actual content and how appealing it, it is will be demonstrated at the hearing of this case. There is also likelihood that as of the moment, even the prosecution is unaware of the actual content of the articles and the impact or effect they may have on those coming across the same. This is more than just speculation. It means that the applicants are being held in custody on speculation. Article 19.3 of the Constitution makes it abundantly clear that the rights and fundamental freedoms in the Bill of Rights belong to each and each individual, and they are for each individual to enjoy. The limitations upon which these rights and freedoms are subject to are spelled out under Article 49 1 of the Constitution, in which, which in short is unless there are compelling reasons to decline bail. The burden lies with the prosecution to establish what the compelling reasons are. All the prosecution has said is that the applicants face terrorism and connected charges. The word terrorism doubtless invokes fear or even terror. However, the prosecution should be able to demonstrate what exactly it is that constitutes the compelling reason. There must be some cogent or tangible basis for alleging so. In this case, nothing cogent or tangible has been demonstrated or placed before the court. For that reason alone, I find there is no compelling reason demonstrated to deny the applicant's bail. The High Court then, that is the end of the quote, the High Court then granted bail to the accused persons even upon considering that these very serious ch uh, charges may pose a security challenge for the country. In the case of Abu Drogo, Mohammed and another versus Republic, Nairobi High Court criminal case number 793 of 2010, Fred Ocheng J rendered himself thus. For now, although the assertions of the state that the applicants had some connection with the suicide bomb are not baseless, the court is obliged by Article 52A to uphold the legal presumption <coughs> that the applicants were innocent until the contrary was proved. Therefore, because of the said legal presumption, it is not open to me to conclude without the benefit of evidence that the applicants had already been connected to Al-Shabaab. I pause here to say that, again, in the present case, there was no evidence which was tendered before this court to show the evidence that the prosecution has against the accused person. I proceed with the court. If I were to so conclude, the said conclusion would be inconsistent with the presumption of innocence. And if the legal presumption was to have tangible meaning at this stage, I must interpret the Constitution in such a manner as to enhance the rights and freedoms granted, rather than in a manner that curtails the said right. In the results, I find that the respondent has not demonstrated any compelling reasons to warrant the denial of bail to the applicants herein. I therefore allow the application." End of quote. The High Court then granted bail on strict bond terms. I'm not only guided but bound by the above decisions where the accused persons were charged with more serious offenses than the ones that the accused person is charged with hearing. The manner in which the prosecution team led by Mr. Mtuku, a deputy DPP, has strongly and ably put across their case for the denial of bond for the accused person is admirable. It is no doubt an, un an a wondrous stance to try to take away a constitutionally guaranteed right of an individual, of any individual. Although the right to bond or bail is not absolute, the Constitution first guarantees it before it qualifies it by stating, unless there are compelling reasons not to be released. The prosecution has argued that the offense is serious with a severe penalty, that the commission of the offense by the accused person led to widespread demonstration in several parts of, of Kenya, and therefore his release may escalate such demonstrations, and that his safety in the circumstances is not guaranteed that the DPP has instituted other investigations into the conduct of the accused person for allegedly being in breach of chapter, of chapter 6 of the Constitution and the Leadership and Integrity Act, that the accused person being a member of the National Assembly is therefore an influential person and therefore his being released on bond may lead to fear among potential witnesses coming forward to record statements and that the accused person misconducted himself by posting on social media about his arrest and therefore this shows that the accused person does not show remorse for acts alleged in the charge. If I were to take each of these points as uh, were countered by uh, uh, Honorable Senator James Orengo and Honorable Otienda Molo, I'll find that they have ably uh, pointed out that, in fact, 
none of those uh, points will uh, count in order to establish that uh, the prosecution has established compelling reasons to deny the accused person's board. It is also alleged that the accused person has been previously charged with other offenses, two of which are an incitement to violence which are similar to the current charge, and this shows that the accused person is likely to repeat these offenses if released on bond. Uh, Mr. Uh, I need not say here that uh, there was no indication that the accused person had ever been convicted on any of those offenses. Learned a, a deputy DPP, Mr. Mtuku, contending to say that some of those offenses had been, uh, some of those charges had been withdrawn, and some of them ha have been drawn after a compromise between the accused person and the uh, complainant. Mr. Mtuku, uh, learned DPP. Uh, Learned Deputy DPP submits further that the threshold of proof in this case is on a balance of, of probabilities, and I've said that uh, that is the position. Ms. Mwaniki sought to put into context the words allegedly uttered by the accused person by saying that in doing so, the accused person was well aware of the history behind them and what happened to the three presidents that uh, he mentioned. She submits a familiar mantra that the threat of violence during and after election is not something that can be wished away, and that this country is in a state of charged political atmosphere and the utterances adhered to the accused person can trigger and indeed triggered political violence as evidenced uh, by the demonstrations earlier referred to. I agree that the threat of political uh, violence in the country is real and therefore must be considered with the seriousness that uh, it deserves. However, the reference to the issues of the former presidents who are removed from power in one way or another in a manner that one may think was unacceptable is a matter that may go then to a submission on whether, if at all the prosecution has proved this case against the accused person, on what type of sentence should be meted out against the accused person, but not at this stage of considering whether the accused person should be released on bond or not. The learned assistant... Uh, Assistant, Senior Di Assistant Director of Public Prosecutions further admitted that in the interest of public order, peace and security, the accused person should not be released on bond or bail. Although Learned uh, Counsel Ms. Uh, Honorable Tienda Molo said that this should not be a factor to consider, going through the bond and bail policy guidelines, I find that in fact it's one of the considerations that the court must give, must uh, make while arriving at its decision. Learned Council also submitted that the prosecution is prepared to conclude the case at the earliest opportunity, as may be directed the, uh, by the court, and that is a laudable move that the prosecution should do all the time. The prosecution has also argued that the accused person's permanent place of residence is not known, as he is known to reside at various places. Learned Senior Counsel, uh, Senator James Orengo, said that there is no problem with the accused person's place of abode being unknown, and also said that, in fact, the fact is that the accused person has several places of abode. Learned Senior Counsel says that the accused person was, uh, sorry, Learned Counsel says that the accused person was arrested for his hiding at Socion Villa <coughs> Apartments, house number C7. I've, I found this submission self-contradictory because I requested Learned Counsel to repeat it, which he did several and she maintained it. It is either the accused person has no permanent place of abode in Kenya and therefore is a flight, a flight risk. Otherwise, if he has a place that is known, there is no legal requirement that one must reside at a place that is known. At least for now in Kenya, that has not been concretized into law. But most importantly, the accused person, it is acknowledged by the prosecution itself, is a member of parliament. One of the fundamental requirements for him to be one or to be a member of parliament is that he must have resided in his constituency for a certain period. Otherwise, he will not have been cleared to even vie for the post for which he uh, is holding that position at the moment. So it will only take the investigating officer to ask the accused person where his place of abode is within his constituency, and then he should be able to, 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 to tell him. Second, the accused person must, as a matter of law, must, as a matter of law, present in the National Assembly where he has a duty to appear and represent his constituents. Otherwise, he will lose his seat. If the accused person was said to be a flight risk, it means also he risks losing his seat in parliament, and I would not think that that has been demonstrated that the accused person is uh, uh, going to do this. That submission, therefore, outrightly does not find favor with the court. The prosecution has also not laid before the court any evidence it has against the accused person, the investigating officer being content to state that uh, uh, to state the issues that were narrated in the supporting affidavit. 
Now, having considered the affidavit evidence presented herein by the prosecution through the investigating of to support the objection of the release of the accused person on bond, I am therefore not persuaded that these are compelling reasons to warrant the denial of bond for the accused person in this case. In contrast, I am persuaded from, uh, from the submissions by landed counsels for the accused person, Honorable Senator James Orengo, Senior Counsel, and Honorable Tienda Molo, that the interests of justice and the country at large will be best served if the accused person is released on bond or bail. Consequently, I'm satisfied that the accused person ought to be released on bond. However, considering the offense with which the accused person is charged in the alternative count, coupled with the politically charged atmosphere in the country at the moment, I'm persuaded by the submission of learned counsel for the prosecution, Mr. Mtuku, Deputy uh, Director of Public Prosecution, and uh, Ms. Mwaniki, Assistant Director of Public Prosecution, that this may as well compromise public order, peace, and security, which is one of the factors to be taken into account when setting bond terms. The numerous number of similar charges that are being filed against various persons and regrettably political leaders from across the political divide across the country, I think warrant enhanced bond bail terms for the accused person hearing. The accused person is therefore granted bond or bail in the granted bond and bail in the following terms. One, the accused person will deposit a sum of cash shillings five hundred thousand in quarters bail. Two, in addition, the accused person shall make available two sureties to be examined by this court, who shall bind themselves in the sum of cash shillings one million, but without depositing a security for their attendance of the accused person at the hearing. And these people shall be of equal standing in society with the accused person. The accused person shall abide by any reasonable requirements that may be made of him by the investigating officer as regards further or any other investigations regarding him in relation to this offense. Those be the orders of the court. <laughs> Yes. Well, Magistrate uh, Francis and I. Still sitting. If you would like to walk out kindly, just uh, take leave so that uh, we are able to carry on with the court proceedings. I actually have three more cases to hear apart from from this case. Yes, Mr. Mtuku. Yes. Yes. Magistrate Francis and I there just finished delivering his ruling on whether Babuino should be uh, released on bail or not. And it seems for now, Mbakasa is a member of parliament. Uh, Babuino is a free man after Magistrate uh, Francis and I ruled that he should be released on a 500,000 shilling bail, uh, saying that some of the reasons that the prosecution gave, led by the Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions, uh, were not compelling reasons uh, to uh, continue uh, holding on to Babowino as investigations uh, continue. So for now, Babowino is a free man who has been released on a 500,000 shilling uh, bail. He was